you're out there, you know, you're out there flying around with, you know, with, without support. And it does certainly help to have had a meditation practice, a long one, 30 years on the cushion daily. And um, that, and the tools, I guess, as I mentioned in, in my talk, you know, I have had received lots and lots of teachings. And so this was my time to, every time I'd done a solitaire, I realized it was my time to actually sit with what I had already learned and really take it in and do some of the practices that I knew. Yeah, so it worked. Yes? Did you have a, a an interim clock, or did you, did you have a, you know, an actual clock that you kept your schedule with? I was happy that I actually had a clock and the battery worked, and uh, mainly because it told me what day it was <laughs> and the temperature. I wrote the temperature down three times, four times a day. I'm a little compulsive here in in Fahrenheit and Celsius, <laughs> and it was important to have the date, you know, because truthfully, if I did not put um, my food list out on a Tuesday, they would come in. They would come down the road and come looking for me, thinking I had an accident or something. So, um, you know, because they were to pick it up on Tuesday and deliver on Wednesday to that box. So I needed that. So, so that was on the clock. Um, LL Bean weather guard. Right. Um, but um, it, I did have an internal clock, most definitely. I was just coming out of retreat yesterday, and people said, "How do you know when to ring the bells and all? Do you have a?" you know, a buzzer or something or other reminds you to, you know, to, it's coming up time. And I said, you know that I could start meditating at 7 o'clock and I'd say, okay, I think it is 7.26. And I'd open my eyes and I would be within a minute or two. You just, yeah, you just do. And I knew it didn't make a bit of difference if there's no one else around. That, you know, sometimes it was a fun thing. Other questions? Yes. Did you have an intention when you went to the prison? And if so, what was it? Or if not, why did you go? Gosh, I would thought you were going to ask me for my intention of doing the solitary retreat, <laughs> which I always love to tell people. It's just basic enlightenment, you know. I just want to <laughs> go up, Scott. You know, be me. <laughs> the intention of going into the prison. Those men heard that I was doing this um, solitary retreat 18 months ago, and they waited for me to come out. They waited. They said, would she ever come and talk with us? And this, I was out maybe two, home two or three days, and somebody approached me. We do have kind of an outreach sangha at the Concord Men's Prison. And um, would I consider? I said, definitely. Let me acclimate a little bit, but definitely. We'll put it on the schedule out to it, because I... I want to go and talk to them. I really do. You know, um, it was important. They have such a harsh life, and they, they, and some of them are just quite amazing. Quite, quite amazing. If you ever have a chance to help someone that has come out, please do it. Please do it, because they need that second chance. All of us do. Right. Right. Other questions? got three people that are eager for questions. Go for it, girl. Mm -hmm. We can have some, I've got a couple chances. We can come back to me. Mm -hmm. They're happy to hear your questions, okay. I think. Go. Did you have, uh, did you experience any um, enlightenment or mystical experiences while meditating? Was that part of your goal? Um, did you look for that? Did you seek that? And did that happen? As I said, I was just basically interested in just pure enlightenment. That was all <laughs> for the light bulb to totally come on. And then I thought, you know, that's goal, and that's grasping, and that's attachment, and that doesn't come from doing those kind of things. That the base, best I could do is just open my hands. I read numerous people that had done retreats and just said that they were, you know, somewhat disappointed that they didn't have that great awakening or whatever. And then I started writing down what I had learned and what I had woken up to, and I thought, well, there's quite a bit there. Those are called little insights rather than the great big insight. And mystical experiences, I hate to mention that, you know, some of us are artists, 
and we, you know, we just go flying. <laughs> Often we've got great imaginations and that carries us a long, long way, for sure. Um, it, you become extremely sensitive on solitary retreats. Everything is heightened. Um, uh, colors and sounds and emotions and feelings, all of these things. So um, dreams are vivid, etc. Um, and so because, I mean, I just, I like to open my hands and just, and open my heart and said, I'll just take in whatever is being offered that I can bring back, I guess, how to change my life. So, um, yeah. And I came back with an extraordinary love of people, of humanity. I was there for, you know, 360 days, I did not see a human face. It was such a delight to um, see people. And when you smile at people, they smile back at you. <laughs> wow, it's that mirror. <laughs> and I realized how very, very much, how I can sit in solitude for 360 days and I can be so gregarious and so interested in others and wanting to do what I'm able to help and learning how to stand and be patient and wait. And yeah, some of the things that you learn. What was like the warmest temperature you experienced in the coldest temperature? 87 degrees in February <clears throat> and a 31 degrees in July. That's Fahrenheit. I could give it to you in Celsius too. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, one J July is winter there. That's when I arrived. And uh, one of the first mornings, well, one of the First morning, I stepped out and looked at the horizon, and I went, my gosh, that's the moon. It looked the size of a penny. It was huge, was the supermoon. And then I realized that the, the, the boards, the um, boardwalk there, was covered in frost. So I got down on my knees with my fingernail, and I carved in the word, frozen. <laughs> I took a picture of it. <laughs> and looked across at the um, pasture on the far side and noticed that it was white. It wasn't snow, but the grass had, you know, when you've got all these trees, the frost doesn't cling. But on a flat surface, you know, even these mornings right now, um, how it, they become white and that pasture was white with frost. And the cows were not out there that day. <laughs> yeah, I got to know them. Interesting thing, I'm up there on that ridge and down below me I knew there was a there was a uh, farm down, way down below, but I, because um, there were some dogs right here occasionally. I named them. There was Wolf and there was Yipper. <laughs> and when I, uh, and I knew, knew it was a family, and that's where the, the, those cows came from. They brought them up that way. Um, one of the first things I did when I came out of retreat was I said, could we go into town? I was going in and having a Chinese dinner, I think it was. I said, could we go left instead of right? I want to go to that farm. They weren't home, but my gosh, there were the dogs. They came rushing up to me. I said, yo, woof, yipper, hi. And they said, actually, that's Lolly and Oscar. You know? And I said, they know me, though. I've been talking with them. When I first was there the first month, you know, the dog barking, I thought, oh, dogs barking. It sounds like, you know, Mexico all over again. And then I got so that I so, I said, oh, who's bothering Yipper down there? Somebody, must be a possum, something's disturbing them. And they were my friends, just my friends as much as anybody else. I just loved hearing them. Something in the world. Green from one side to the other, and other than the clouds, that's all I had. So hearing some dogs bark, I knew humanity was out there someplace. And someday I was going to come back and join it. Verbalizing that, or were you internalizing that? Uh, always internalizing it. I didn't speak. You didn't speak at all. Mm. No singing. No singing. No. Yeah, right. You know, I chant. I do prayers regularly. I couldn't open. I couldn't break my. I couldn't break the silence. I whispered them. I know that people think it's bizarre. I could not. It's an amazing effort to make your voice work. You find that out when you're silent. It takes a lot of energy, and I watched that. 
And so all of the prayers and the chanting, I kind of whispered to myself. I didn't speak. Once or twice I did. And that was when I was coming around the corner of the house, and I said, oh my gosh! And the quail were all in front there. And I froze, you know. And I thought, oh, that was my voice. <laughs> but I froze because the quail, um, you know, I could frighten them, but I wanted to see them. So every time I found quail, I stopped 20 minutes. I stood frozen watching, you know. And I learned the lifestyle of quail. They, they go around foraging and picking and digging and scrunching. And then at, in, in seven or ten minutes, they stop. They make little nests. They crunch to go down. They have a little snooze for about ten minutes. And then they get up and start doing it again. <laughs> Who would know this? <laughs> and every time this happened, one male, and I knew it was male by his comb on his head, stood guard duty, separated himself. Some of the girls came over and snuggled around him, and, you know. And he separated himself and watched to make sure, to keep an eye out. And he would make a little squawk if anything was happening, and they all had to jump up and take off. Anyways, I know a great deal about California quail, <laughs> which was fun. And those other birds, really, six, six o'clock in the morning, the chaffinch would peck, 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 and I'd go, Okay, I'll open my curtains. I'll put the bird seat out for you. You're ready. So, 19 different species I identified. I was never a birder. I'm a birder now. <laughs> 19 species. Yeah, yeah. So, it was New Zealand's the other side of the world. It has trees you've never seen. Oh, I didn't mention that one pine tree that I climbed down to. That within the first day or two, I had to go down and see where the river was running. I, and I had to, and you saw a slide of that or so, I had to go down to this pine tree that I could see the top of on this great hill going down. Um, because I live in New Hampshire. Pines are very, very familiar to me. Pines are not native to New Zealand. There was one pine tree. So I would crawl down to that pine tree at times when I might be low and put my shoulder against it and lay my head against the trunk and get some energy from it and smell the needles, and I connected. So, those are some of the, the silly things. The ways to keep happy, you know, the ways to keep your joy going. So, so I hope this was interesting to you. I have a few things I wanted to, just in closing, wanted to share um, with you, if I can. I have tremendous deep gratitude for about 81 people. Uh, who helped me to fly me over and fly me back and to house me, to feed me for 360 days. People who bought me warm clothes and rain gear and some decent walking shoes. And they are deeply thanked. Many of them are here tonight. And to the staff and the other retreatants at the Sudarshan Loka Retreat Center in Thames and the Auckland Center, there were people who baked me miniature mince pies and sent them in along with chocolate. For people that there was the people that shared their kindness and their care for me, researching lice treatment, uh, sauerkraut, oolong tea, and miso soup paste. For, and for the seven friends from Boston to Florida, to Danville to Deerfield, who helped me by transcribing my four journal books and uh, continue to help me with editing them for a possible book. Um, if you're interested at all, there may, <clears throat> may be a book out next spring or next summer. And if you're, you would like news, you could go ahead and leave me an email over here, and I'll make sure you have that information for you. Um, if you're interested in what I did on solitary, there's an exhibition happening at uh, Aria Loka Buddha Center, hanging right now. It's called Art from a Year of Silence. Um, that Aria Loka is up in Newmarket, New Hampshire. Uh, it's there until November 25th. Um, if you're unable to get to Newmarket, um, some of those images are on my website, and I'm easy to find. All you have to do is type in Kirana Da on Google, and 
I will come up in 15 different places. <laughs> the hours are limited for that exhibition. It's Monday to Friday, just from 11 to 3, so that's not always so easy. But this weekend on Sunday, we have an arts evening of poetry, music, and arts, and so you can come and see the work at that time, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the pieces that are there. If you're interested in cowrie trees, some of those giant trees that are like um, Seminoles, and, um, and also in what I did with, <laughs> my son said I had to share this with you, I collected the stickers from every piece of fruit um, from 12 months, and I made art from it. <laughs> and there's a picture, I, and it's there in the hut, still in the hut, along with the chair that I painted. But there's photographs of those over there for you to take a look at if you want to know. For some reason, he thinks that's the most interesting part of <laughs> all of the artwork that I did. So. <laughs> so. I also wanted to mention that um, we do meditate here every Wednesday, uh, Wednesday morning from 9 to 10. It's a small group, and it's been going on for four years. It happens whether I'm here or whether I'm not. And we're now starting an evening group, um, probably from 6 50, that's 6.45, 6.50 to 7.50, um, squeezing it in there. We expect